Good morning, everyone. We are on day two of the Jetscape Summer School. Let's give other colleagues maybe a few more seconds to join us, and then we will begin with the first session of the day, which is a colleague, Chaturanga Sirmana. He'll be giving a talk on the Jetscape and Escape framework. There'll be hands-on activities in the session. So for the next one hour, one and a half hour or so, we will be working on this topic of Jetscape and Escape framework. So everybody welcome once again, and we will soon begin with the talk from Chaturama and Chaturanga, sorry. Chat Chaturanga, are you all set? Uh, yes, I am. I, I will share my screen. Awesome. Thank you. And just so that everybody knows, it's highly encouraged that you are part of our Slack channel for asking questions. And we will be monitoring the questions. And uh, just so that uh, you all know, the Zoom chat sessions are not saved. So please uh, do type in your questions on Slack and we will be monitoring them and pausing our speaker when the time is right to prompt them for answering your questions. So thank you very much. Over to you, Chaturanga. Uh, thank you, Ritu. Uh, so uh, today we are going to. Uh, work on uh, some basic stuff that we need to know when we are working with uh, Jetscape and Xscape framework. Uh, as you said yesterday, uh, Jetscape is inside a new Xscape framework. Uh, that means we can work on Jetscape uh, by using Xscape framework. So in this hands-on session, what I am doing is uh, uh, similar uh, framework session, framework hands-on session, which we done in last couple of years, but inside the Xscape framework. And first, uh, uh, you need to join into this uh, Slack channel, July 17, 18 framework. Then you can type any question over there and uh, it will be answered uh, so quickly and you can move on with the hands-on session. And in this session, Ismail and Ritoban will help me uh, as TAs. So uh, you can ask any questions uh, in Slack channel and there will be many others uh, who can help uh, with your question. And I will stop uh, this session time to time so that uh, I can see if everyone is on the, on the board with the everything. Okay, so before going into the details, let's see, let's take a quick poll uh, to see whether you uh, everybody is installed uh, everything and uh, completed all the preparation. And if you if you completed all the preparation, just put this uh, tick mark. And if you partially finished or incomplete, uh, put the uh, this red cross mark so that we can understand uh, everybody in board uh, for the hands-on session. Uh, I'll give a couple of uh, moments to uh, put everyone uh, their answers for this poll. This is very important because uh, moving forward, we need to and we need to uh, get everything. Uh, I mean, the Docker container and 
all the other required components. If not, it's gonna take a lot of time uh, because compiling or compiling only can take uh, maybe it's about a couple of minutes or more, depending on your system and. I can only see one tick. Uh, So there, there are also some people using uh, thumbs up uh, and not tick emoji, but fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, it seems like enough people put uh, thumbs up or tick or uh, whatever they, I think they feel okay with the session. So let's move on. Uh, so first you have to uh, download the hydro sample uh, file because uh, here we are going to use uh, part on gun. That means mono energetic jet. Uh, within a hydro medium. So first uh, go to the Xscape. Uh, so beforehand, uh, you have to go to the uh, Docker container. So let me show that. Uh, so. so. We can check uh, the status of your Docker containers by using uh, Docker ls minus a. So I already created the Docker container. So I can enter my Docker container by using Docker start minus ai and the name of the Docker container. Okay. So now I am inside the Docker container. If you can uh, LS, you can see uh, there's summer school and escape repository inside. And we can go inside the escape, CD, escape, and inside escape, you can see uh, there are uh, many files and folders inside. You need to go to the examples directory. And you can get the hydro sample uh, by doing dot slash get hydro sample centrality zero to five. And it will take some time. Uh, as it needs to download. Okay. While it is downloading, let's move on uh, to the next part. So this is how we need to uh, 
this is what I did previously. Uh, Entered in the Docker container. And in this, uh, if we need to run Jetscape inside the Xscape framework, we need to use the XML configuration uh, similar to the Jetscape framework. And there are two XMLs that we need to consider about. Uh, the first one is the master XML. Uh, it is known as Jetscape main inside the Jet Jetscape framework. And you need to use a user XML file, which you edit uh, so that you can put all the modules that you need uh, in your current run. Chachurunga? Yeah. There's a question in Slack. Somebody's stuck. Okay. Uh, also, Chaturanga, I'll take this moment to pass on one request from the audience. They're saying to increase the font size in the terminal. Okay, yeah, I, I will do that. Uh, is this okay? Uh, Oh, should I increase more? I think it's readable, but it's better than before. I think this is better, yeah. Okay. But we can check with the audience if everybody is fine with this. Oh, we don't have the content. So, so if you don't have anything inside your Docker, uh, that means you uh, you haven't created the Docker container. So you can create the Docker container uh, uh, by using, uh, so there are some instructions in the... Uh, yeah, Chatur, let, uh, I will let Joe handle that. The okay. people who have not done any installation or installation issues. Okay. Um, yeah, sure. I would, I would, like maybe you can focus on the technical aspects of the of the hands-on session that you're doing. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So usually installing this hydro uh, sample takes some time, and. Uh, once this hydro sample is installed, uh, then we can move on uh, with the remaining part. Uh, so first, uh, let's check the master XML file, which contains all the required, uh, all the modules that one can use inside the Jetscape framework. And one can use these modules inside the user XML file uh, and uh, create a, a proper simulation. Uh, can we have a quick poll uh, to check whether everybody downloaded the uh, Hydro sample. So if uh, if you download the hydro sample, then you can uh, put a check mark or thumbs up. And if you if you struggle, if you have any question, then put those questions in the Slack. Okay. I see many people uh, downloaded the hydro.
sorry, Chatur, one, <clears throat> one small request <clears throat> from yeah. folks. They want the slides updated on the Indigo page because in case they are lagging, they can also follow from the slides. Is it okay. possible to put it? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, just give me a minute. I will prepare the uh, PDF file and put it in. Yeah, I think that will be useful for folks. Okay. Just a gentle reminder, everybody's requested to please post the questions in the Slack window. So it looks like I cannot uh, put directly into the uh, website. So I will send it to you, Raghav, and you can put it. Yep, sounds good. You could also just post it on the Slack channel just for now, the PDF. Oh, okay. Yeah, that I think. Okay, so my hydro files are downloaded. So first let's look at the uh, master XML file. So master XML file is uh, all XML files are located inside the uh, config directory. So you need to go config, you can see all the available XML files and you can uh, view master XML file in your uh, uh, whatever the software you like. Let's get, let's get main. And it contains a lot of information. So Initially, you can put uh, the event information, number of events. Uh, if you are using Hydro, Hydro from file, you can set it to reuse uh, and some technical details. And also the outputs, most importantly, you can use different outputs, ASCII, ASCII GSHIP, uh, HEPMC, root HEPMC, and also, if you don't need all the event information, you can get uh, final state patterns and final state hadrons as ASCII file, which uh, reduce your 
uh, space uh, very much and these commands you can use these commands uh, there and uh, you can uh, change the randomness by using this random seed and uh, for the initial state you can read the initial state from file or you can use trendo which is uh, available inside jetscape and also one can use mac global as initial state when it comes to hard process uh, that means initial hard scattering or uh, initial hard part on you can use initial hard part on from part on gun uh, here you can select the energy or the transverse momentum of the initial part on and uh, the part on id and if you need a more realistic simulation then you can use uh, petia gun uh, where you can select uh, where you can use petia for the initial hard scattering uh, in this uh, hands on session we're going to use p gun uh, for simplistic uh, simulation and it uh, takes uh, less time compared to full realistic simulation and when it comes to energy loss, uh, we have different energy loss modules, and there are different parameters that you can tune uh, uh, inside these energy loss modules. Uh, namely, they are matter, LBT, Martini, and ADS CFT. Uh, so you can use a combination of uh, these uh, energy loss modules, uh, or uh, you can use single energy loss module as you decide. And there are other modules like pre-equilibrium, and also we can uh, simulate hydro by using uh, brick or gubs or hydro. Uh, we can read from a hydro file, or we can use music to uh, generate hydro profile on the run. Music or CLV. And for the hadronization, uh, there are three built-in hadronizations, colored, colorless. Uh, those hadronizations use uh, Petia string fragmentation and the hybrid hadronization. Yeah, where you will learn about hybrid hadronization in a couple of days in the hybrid hadronization session. And after the hadronization, there are, uh, one can use uh, particleization models, I ISS and hadronic afterburner. So these are all the modules that uh, you can use inside the Jetscape. But in this session, we are not going to use all these modules. Uh, you will eventually use this different uh, set of these modules in uh, upcoming hands-on session. Now let's move on to the uh, user uh, XML file. So. So in this case, uh, we, are, we are using three user XML configurations, one for the vacuum simulation and one with matter and LBT module combination for the medium simulation uh, inside the hydro. And the other one is matter and Marty. And then uh, we're gonna use these results uh, to get the, the uh, hadron distribution uh, as a graph uh, just to get some graphical idea about uh, what we are getting so first let's uh, check these xml configurations these xml configurations are available in the uh, summer school uh, july 18th and inside the xml directory so let's move to that. So we have uh, 
we have three XML files. Let's first look at the uh, use, X, uh, use XML file for vacuum. So in this vacuum XML file, uh, let's set this number of events to 200 if it is not set already. Uh, we can use any number of events, but uh, for the current time constraint, we can uh, limit it to 200, but you can try uh, more if you want to. And here we are using Jetscape write ASCII. That means uh, we are using ASCII output, and we set hadron output and parton output on. And we are using pgun with 100 GeV uh, blue on. And here we are using colorless hadronization. Therefore, we set uh, hybrid hadronization uh, not to use hybrid hadronization. And for the energy loss, since we are in vacuum, we are only using matter energy loss module uh, with uh, virtuality separation scale one. And we need to set this in vacuum uh, mode on. That means we set this flag to one. And All the others are some, uh, we don't need recoil since we are in vacuum and broadening or any other me any medium. Therefore, we set everything to zero. And for the hadronization, we are using colorless hadronization. And this is actually the PP19 tune that we used uh, for, the, for all our uh, Proton proton simulation result. So, if you have any question uh, about this uh, XML files, uh, please post them on the Slack. And let's move on. Okay. Satchunga? Yeah. Uh, you should. You are muted, uh, Sangha. So these are the all the parameters you can tune inside this uh, use XML configuration. Uh, um, Chatur, I, I think. Okay, yes, go ahead, Sangha. Yes. Yes, uh, you should. There are some questions on in the in the Slack channel. Okay. Uh, yeah. Some people are asking where the files are. Okay. So all these files are available uh, inside this uh, summer school 2023 GitHub repository under uh, July 18, uh, July 18 framework. Uh, and So you can uh, you can use uh, Jetscape uh, Jetscape framework paper, which is available in uh, archive. Uh, there you you have all the information you need uh, about all the modules and all the parameters inside the the XML. No. 
and inside the XML, you can uh, set the uh, output format uh, to FMC root. Uh, just, uh, just copy that part from the main XML and paste it over here uh, in the use XML, then you will get that kind of output. So all the outputs available are listed in the main, but don't edit inside the main. Just copy that into user configuration and you will you can turn it on from here and you will have that output at the end. Okay, so, so all the other, all other technical questions will be answered uh, uh, inside this lab. Okay, now let's generate some events. So now we have a final user XML file. And here we set the ASCII outputs, as I said earlier. And to do that, just go to uh, home, escape and build. So in the build directory, uh, I'm, I'm assume that you already uh, see me can make, uh, oh, oh, let's have a quick poll so that we can understand if all are on board. Uh, did you uh, compile the Jetscape, uh, the, compile the Xscape uh, framework? Uh, if, you, if you compiled, just put thumbs up or Tick mark. If you if you haven't compiled yet, uh, put a cross mark or thumbs down. Will work as well. Sorry. Okay. It seems like some people are haven't do that. So it can take some time depending on your configuration, uh, but uh, I already have compiled, so, but I will show how you can do that. So you can do, first you can do CMake. And you need to use the so in this case we don't need any other modules like music or iss therefore we can just do the steam and we need to set uh, the standard C++ for 14. So we use this flag minus DC make CXX standard equals 14. Uh, this flag makes uh, use of uh, C++ 14 for this compilation. So once you do that, you can see uh, this kind of uh, this kind of instructions. And if you have any compilation issue, you can uh, put it on Slack and we'll get your help immediately. So CMake is done, then you can do make. And making can uh, take a lot of time depending on your configuration. You can use any number of uh, cores available uh, in your Docker container. So make minus J and enter number of cores available. In my case, I can only use uh, three cores. So I will use three 
but if you have many cores uh, let's say if you have eight cores you can use eight all eight cores uh, for this and it will take less time and if you have one core then it can take a lot of time if you haven't already compiled since i i already compiled uh, i will only get this kind of output Once compilation is completed, uh, you will enter back to the uh, default terminal. So I will give some time for you to uh, do the compilation. And if you have any question, uh, you can answer me right. Maybe just a quick recap. So people are somewhat, they realize they have to build the builder, they have to make the build directory, right? And then going into build, and then what should they do next? Just to kind of re reiterate. Yeah. So, okay. So if you, if you, if you don't have a build directory, just create the build directory. Uh, you can do that by using make mkdir and and then uh, cd into the build and then you can start with the cmake uh, where i use uh, cmake uh, dot dot minus dc make standard equal to 40 and once uh, CMake completed, you can do the make with available number of cores. Then you are ready to go. So let's see how many of you completed CMake step. So if you completed CMake, then uh, uh, use a thumbs up or tick mark. Otherwise you can use the cross mark or thumbs down. Okay, it looks. So for the people who, uh, who was unable to do the CMake, you can uh, if you have any question, just uh, put it in the Slack and uh, you can fix that uh, issue. Okay. It looks good. Uh, I only see one uh, cross mark. And give, let's give a couple of minutes for make because it can take a lot of time if you haven't done it already.
Okay, so if you completed the make step, uh, similarly, you can use the thumbs up or tick mark, if not, use the cross mark. Yeah, so far I haven't seen any cross marks. If you, if you are still working on that, please uh, let us know by using a cross mark. Okay, I can see one cross mark. So, so far I only saw one cross mark, so. So that means most of the people are complete with the next step. Okay. So, yeah, let's give them a couple of minutes and then let's move on with this. So once you complete uh, complete make and compiling everything, you can just go to the build directory. If you are inside the build directory, you did. You don't need to do anything. So yeah, we were here. So just uh, you can just use run Jetscape and. Uh, specify the user XML file uh, by specifying the path of the user XML file like this. And then let it run. It will run for 200 events and uh, it will store your, uh, store the final state hadrons and final state partons uh, information uh, as to ASCII file. Let me show that. Uh, so here we are using this vacuum XML file. And once we do that, you can see there are a lot of information. So here Jetscape is initialized and it recognized two XML files, Jetscape main and the XML file that we specified, the vacuum XML file. Here we have all the information that we provided. Uh, there are 200 events and this, since we are in vacuum, we don't need to worry about these two lines. And the CD0, since we use CD0, and there are different tasks. Uh, P gun is for the hard process, and for the energy loss, there's matter, and for the hadronization, colorless hadronization. And uh, we are using Jetscape Writer uh, as key and final state hadrons and partons as well. So, so here, uh, Jetscape initialize all these modules uh, and uh, the information about these modules are available here.
So after after the initialization, uh, it runs Jetscape uh, for 200 events and finally uh, finished in uh, in about nine seconds. In real time, it's like 46 46 seconds. And let's see how many of you completed this. Uh, we can have another poll for that as well. Okay, many of you completed. That's good. It looks like most of you completed this part. Now let's move on to the next part where we are using the. Uh, before that, let's look in peek into the final state hadron output. So in the final state hadron output, if you uh, let's look at the output. So if you ls, you can see this. So I have many outputs because I used it previously. But you can VI to the test out uh, PGAN, vacuum, and final state hadrons. So, that. so this is the final state hadron file. So in the first line, uh, it says, what are the information provided? Uh, the first line represents the index, and the second line is part on ID. Third line is the status. Uh, in this case, uh, the status is not important since we are in vacuum, but when, it, when we are in medium, this status is important because uh, we can identify recoil partons and uh, medium partons and uh, uh, different kind of patterns produced inside the pattern sh shower. And then we have energy, Px, Py, and Pc. And here uh, it is specified the now event number, uh, if there's any weight, and event plane angle, and number of hadrons in that event. So you will get similar. Uh, output final for final state patterns as well. Uh, and it is the output is similar for the medium uh, or anything, uh, any other uh, module combination. Okay. Now let's move on to the uh, ASCII output. So this ASCII output is the output with all the event information. So it contains, uh, first contains the event information, uh, event number and uh, other information like- uh, Hey Chatur, hey Chatur, yeah. Chatur. Let, yeah, let's, let's, let's take a little bit of the pause here yeah, uh, sure. because there are some people who are not uh, able to continue because th then this doesn't make a lot of sense to them, right? They, they need to have the output in order to follow along with your discussion th that you have. Yeah. So I, I think we're going to take a pause and okay. yeah. there are a lot of discussions in the, in, the, in the Slack channel. There are a lot of folks who are not able to even get past CMIC. Okay, so let's let's start there and hope that we get a lot of more people along compiling. Uh, okay. And yeah, so let's let's take five to ten minutes and then we can continue. 
because okay. we have yeah, multiple cool. hands-on sessions. Yeah, so we we can just keep going there. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you want, if you happen to ask a question on Slack and it hasn't been replied, you should post it again, just in case we missed it and, and all the different questions that were asked. Um, you can also look at the other questions people ask because there are answers to many of the questions already. Yeah, most importantly, you need to be inside the container. Uh, if you're outside the container, you don't have all the uh, all the required uh, dependencies to compile Jetscape. So if you're outside uh, the Docker container, you won't be able to uh, compile. So if you have managed to compile it, get the CMake fully done, uh, can you please put a thumbs up or whatever in the, in the Zoom? Okay, I'm seeing a few people, that's, that's great, excellent. 
but we definitely would be happy with uh, more people trying to do this. So if, if you get, <coughs> if you're stuck with an error message, please post it on the, on the Slack and we are monitoring it and we're trying to respond as fast as we can. And also, this is very important for upcoming hands-on sessions because uh, you will not have enough time to work on these installation issues uh, when you have uh, uh, future hands-on session. So let's wait until 10 and maybe uh, move on. I just want to make a general comment to everybody who's posting screenshots of the errors that they're seeing. It, it also would be very helpful uh, in terms of time if you also post the command that you ran just before the error happened. Because uh, usually the screenshot only gives you the end of the of the error and we don't know what command you run. So we have to ask you and then you post that. So, you know, post the command that you ran and then the screenshot with the error. So in the final state output, the status means uh, what kind of partons that we can identify, what kind of uh, parton or hadron uh, so that uh, we can do uh, the analysis more carefully. So for an instance, if you have recoils, then we need to know which uh, particles are coming from recoils uh, that means which particles are holes, then we can subtract these holes from the final result. So for that, uh, that is one use of this uh, status. So there are many uses of this status, but uh, that's how we use this status. It's it's similar to Petya. So if you look at Petya, there are there's status for different particles uh, inside the shower so that we can identify what kind of part particle that is. Can I make a comment also? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can. Yeah, I just want to make a general comment. If, if you get an error while compiling, can you try compiling it then with make, but without doing this minus two J. And uh, because when, when you do this J with many cores, then the error is not in sync and compile it. And you don't know where the error is exactly. So you just do make without this course, just make directly. And then you can post errors. I hope it's, it's understandable what I just said. Yeah. So what he said was like, uh, 
when we compile, we use uh, make j minus j3. That means we are using uh, three cores. And when you use this kind of uh, line, then uh, error is posted sometimes after it actually uh, occurred. So because of that, we cannot exactly identify. So if you have error, you can just use make without this J part. So the two commands that I used, I will I will post them in the Slack so that if anyone is lagging behind, they can use those commands. Let's have a quick poll. Uh, so if, if you are still struggling, please post a uh, thumbs down or uh, cross mark. Uh, okay. I saw one. So you can edit the XML file. You can change the number of events uh, uh, or any other thing. Uh, uh, but if you if you run it without any edit, it it should work. So just to re reiterate, there are people asking questions on this on the chat here on Zoom. Silas, so if you can put it in the Slack, that would be great. And for others as well. Thanks.
Okay, I think this was useful in the sense, but we should get going because we have the next uh, talk after yours in uh, 25 minutes. So maybe let's, yeah. Yeah. And also like, if you have any questions, you can uh, post it in the Slack after the, uh, after this session, anytime today so that you can finish uh, all these preparation before tomorrow's hands-on session because it will be uh, more beneficial and some people uh, use this uh, uh, global uh, flag on uh, that we don't need in this session but uh, i put all the information uh, at the uh, at this slide uh, at the end, uh, so that you can prepare for the next uh, sessions. So you don't need to do everything uh, listed here. Okay. So let's uh, check this finance state hydron output again. So this is the final state output. Uh, so what I said previously was uh, this first line indicates the index and the second line is part on ID. The third line is status then energy PX, PY and PC. In this second line, it shows the event, weight, event plane angle and number of hadrons. The second line is, uh, this kind of line is available for, before each event. So if you go like uh, after 85 uh, particles, you can see the second event starts after that. Similarly, it will go to the third event. And uh, there's uh, the full event information is available in test out vegan vacuum uh, file. So in that, uh, first it states the, the event number and uh, the final cross section after that event. And this is the initial hard part on that we used from PGAR. And for jet energy loss, it feed this initial part on to the jet energy loss. And then it shows the uh, part on shower uh, like this. And then uh, finally, it will show the final state hadrons uh, uh, coming from this shower then it will move on to the second event. So the important information is like this part has event information. This is the shower initiative part on. Uh, this is the shower initiative part on like here. And then the part on shower history. Uh, uh, what happens inside the part on shower and finally the uh, final state hadron. So the importance of this uh, SK output is one can use uh, the entire part on shower if they need to use and this is uh, this is important in some uh, analysis. Now let's move on to the uh, second part where we are using uh, matter and LBT combination. Uh, as since Jetscape is multi-stage event generator, so we are using two stages by using matter and LBT. Matter is for the high virtuality portion and LBT is for the low virtuality portion. So 
Let's look at the XML file. So in this XML file, uh, if you have many events, it can take a lot of time. Uh, you can set it to see 100 or maybe 50. Uh, and you can change it later uh, and try it again as a homework with higher number of events. Uh, So here we are, since we are using hydro as a file, we need to set to use hydro through uh, and set uh, number of uh, reuse hydro as 100 because 100 or more, because we only have one hydro event and we are using the same hydro event uh, repeatedly for all 100 events. And similarly, uh, similarly, we have the uh, Jetscape write ASCII on with uh, final state hadrons and final state partons. And for the initial state, uh, we are using the file path for the initial state and hydro uh, as well. For the energy loss modules, we use matter and LBT. Uh, these are the parameters used for matter. Virtual separation is set to two, and similarly, it is set to two for LBT. And uh, all the parameters are set uh, for, for the default uh, meta and LPT2. So you can see the XML file similarly. So sim here also we are using PGUN uh, to get monoenergetic jet. And uh, for the Hadronization, we are using colorless hadronization uh, as usual. Okay, so now we can run with this XML file. So you can just uh, use this run Jetscape with uh, this XML file, similarly as vacuum. So it is started uh, as the vacuum file. It recognized the two XML files and we can check if it recognized the two XML files as we need. And then the number of events, I didn't change it uh, from 100. Uh, so uh, we use reuse hydro and it is also 100. And for the initial state, we are using uh, read from file and therefore it add initial state uh, from file. Uh, and for the hard process, we use PGUN. And for the pre-dynamics, we don't, we only have null pre-dynamic. And for hydro, hydro from file. And for the energy loss, we have two energy loss modules, matter and LBT. And uh, for the hadronization, we use colorless hadronization and everything is similar to the vacuum. And here also the initial information for the 
module initialization. And since we are using LBT, we need to download the LBT tables. If you haven't downloaded the LBT tables, you will start. Uh, you will uh, terminate from here because LBT cannot run without LBT tables. So if you haven't used the initial instructions to download the LBT tables, you can, let me show how you can uh, download the LBT tables. Uh, so you need to go to the uh, directory uh, external let me show yeah once once uh, this uh, this is finished i will show how to download that uh, it's inside the external packages uh, there's a script called uh, get lbt tab you can use that script to download lbt tables so since this is in medium simulation, it takes a lot of time compared to the vacuum simulation. So if you complete this, uh, please use uh, uh, thumbs up or check mark. And if you are struggling, uh, then use the cross mark or thumbs down. Okay, I can see a couple of thumbs up. Hi, can you show once more how to get the LBT table? Yeah, I, I will show once uh, this completed. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, okay, thank you. So if you go to uh, this slide, there's a way. So you need to go to escape external packages and use this get lbt tab to get the lbt table do we then also need to cmake again uh, yeah so if you got lbt tables you need to cmake again uh, if not uh, it won't be compiled within with the framework uh, i i forgot to mention that it's a good question You don't need to use the all the other flags uh, when you are doing the CMake. You just need to use this uh, CX exporting. So after this, you have to do the Meta plus Martini simulation. So I will skip this part because this is exactly similar to Meta and LBT simulation. You can do it as a homework. And after finishing this part, we'll 
move on to the uh, writing a custom module because that part is more important uh, since this is kind of like repeated. So it is completed. It took a uh, relatively uh, large time compared to the vacuum simulation. So I will quickly show how to get the uh, LBT tables if you have if you are still struggling with that. So just uh, CD to escape and external packages, and there you have different uh, get commands uh, you need to use get lbt table comma so that means dot slash get L lbt tab and it also can take uh, some time since it is downloading from uh, external storage and after that you have to see make and make again uh, to include that in the Jetscape, uh, compiled Jetscape code. Okay, so let's see. Uh, so, can we have a quick poll uh, so that we can see how many people completed or are struggling with the code? Similarly, you can use a thumbs up or check mark or cross or thumbs down if you are still working on that. Okay, so far I see only one uh, or two. Okay. Yeah, it can take some time if you uh, haven't downloaded the LPT tables. So let's uh, give some time uh, for them. And uh, I was planning to use a uh, small uh, analysis part, but you can do this analysis part uh, as a homework because uh, uh, you don't have to do any modification inside the inside the analysis code. And if you have any trouble, use uh, you can use the Slack space, uh, and uh, I'll try to. Uh, help you as much as I can.
So still there are a few people mm, trying to caught uh, up with the simulation. Mm. Let's give them a couple of minutes and I will start the next part around 10.30 because I have to finish this uh, by 10.45. So if you got LBT tables, you have to see, make and make. If you didn't do that, then uh, it will show the same error message again. But this time it won't take much time because you already make uh, compiled uh, before. So it won't take much time as is previously. Okay, so let's move on to the last part of this hands-on session. Uh, we are, uh, we'll try to uh, learn how to write a custom module inside the Jetscape. Okay. So for that, you need to copy these two uh, files. Uh, so my shell, uh, there are two files, header and cc file. You need to copy them to uh, this location, xkp src jet. So these two files uh, have information uh, for new custom module and you can modify the do energy loss part uh, as you want so that it uh, uh, so that it uh, do the energy loss according to your uh, energy loss module so i will give some time for you to look into this and then i will uh, 
use this on my terminal. So so we need to copy it's inside summer school uh, July 18 framework and inside that directory you can have you can copy everything to escape src Jet. Okay. So now let's see what is inside those files. First, let's look at the header file. So uh, for this header file, we need to include the Jet Energy Loss module and it, it inherits from the Jet Energy Loss module. And for the public uh, functions, we have the initialization function and do energy loss and write task. These are the most essential uh, components uh, for your own energy loss module. And if you look at uh, the CC file, so uh, constructors and destructors are defined. And for the initialization, uh, we are just uh, writing information line saying that custom module is initialized and then for the uh, right task we need to uh, we need to write uh, the information coming from the uh, this new uh, energy loss module uh, to the uh, final uh, outputs and the in the do energy loss part this is where you need to uh, implement your uh, energy loss module and uh, just for the test purpose we are using this information line which is uh, uh, which will be shown uh, in the desktop output. So you can change this information line, or you can uh, you can add something to this uh, do energy loss module and uh, try your own energy loss. Uh, in this case, we are. Uh, we are trying to run this as it is. So to run this, you need to add this new energy loss module uh, to the both to both use and master XML files. So in the main XML file, you can add a line custom module uh, like this, where you use your custom energy loss module as custom gel you can add in between this energy loss uh, portion uh, of the main 
XML file. So you can change your, the name of the module as you wish. Since we don't have any parameters to define, so we don't need any other information. We only need the name of the module. And then we can add the same lines in the user XML file. And uh, there's a XML file that uh, is available inside the uh, uh, July 18 framework directory. So let's check that use XML file. Okay. So we are, we are only running one event just to uh, see uh, and uh, we are using two uh, hadron and parton outputs but uh, we don't need those outputs exactly because uh, this new energy loss module doesn't do anything to these outputs and the important part is we add this custom module inside this energy loss same as the uh, main xml file So I will post this part in the Slack if you want to copy this. Chaturanga, there is a question from the audience in the Slack window. They're asking, which file do we have to open to add custom module? And if anyone wants, yeah, you can copy this portion. Okay. Now we can go to the uh, build directory. So, Similarly, we can use run Jetscape and specify the uh, user uh, XML file. And it will run. So, Let's look at this output. So, so similarly, the uh, two XML files, and after that, we have hard process, and for the energy loss, we have matter and the custom module. And everything else uh, looks similar. So this is where we initialize the custom and jet energy loss module. Uh, so uh, these are the information lines that we put uh, when we define the initialization uh, or init uh, function inside the custom module. And my general, uh, my uh, our jet energy loss module module provide this output as its uh, execution portion. Uh, when a part on enters to this energy loss module, it will uh, print this line. Uh, that's why even though we have only one event, we have many outputs. Uh, from my jet and Agilos. Chaturunga, 
So there are some requests. The last time, let's have a quick poll. Uh, if you're done with this, or if you have any issue, you can use the cross mark. So Turunga, I think some people are requesting that you know to go through this once again. They they miss they miss some steps. Can you hear me? We can hear you. I don't know if Shadro can hear us. And while you are working on that, uh, this is kind of important in the next sessions because you need to use different uh, dependencies inside the Jetscape framework. Chato, so can you hear us? You have, it's, it's better if you can download all these uh, modules. And if you use uh, 3D GUPS, uh, you need to use you may need to use this uh, get lha pdf.sh. If not, uh, there might be compiling issues. So if you follow this, and then you can do the CMake and make by using this command, it will be sufficient for uh, next phase. Yes, Abhijit. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Uh, I cannot hear you. Hello, can you hear us? I don't think Chaturunga can hear us. Yeah. Oh. I'm sorry, there, there was an issue with my computer. Uh, I couldn't hear. Can you hear us now? Yeah. Okay, Sangyong, go ahead. Yes, uh, some people are asking to go through this once again. I mean, some uh, I think some are lost in during the, the um, okay, yeah, some steps. Yes. Okay. So, this uh, let's start from here. So, you have to copy uh, this my jet energy loss header and cc file uh, from this uh, july 18 framework directory to the uh, xscape src jet directory so you can do that so let me clear this up So you can do, do that like this. And once you copy that, then we can check. So let's check the header file again. So in the header file, uh, we have uh, all the functions defined inside this uh, uh, this jet uh, custom jet energy loss module this is inherited from jet energy loss module uh, class and we need to define the init function do energy loss function and write function uh, in order to have a proper uh, energy loss module then if you look at this cc file so c 
similarly as any class construct and destruct are defined. Uh, and for the jet energy loss init initialization, we need to define this init function. For the init function, we are uh, just printing uh, some information, initialize custom jet energy loss module, and the, uh, the name of the energy loss module uh, is printed. And after that, it says it's initialized. And for the right task, uh, we need to uh, write any output coming from this uh, energy loss module to the final output. Uh, we need to use uh, these commands for to do that. And for the do energy loss, this is where the main core of the energy loss module stays. And you, need, you can define any energy loss inside this part. And since we don't have any real energy loss, we are just drawing uh, just a text output like this. And then uh, you can go into your build directory and you can, uh, before that, you have to implement these. Uh, this new uh, energy loss module inside the main and use XML file. So uh, there's a use XML file provided. Uh, you can go to summer school, July 18 framework, and there's the uh, Jetscape user PP19 XML file. And here, uh, I use these three lines to implement this custom jet energy loss module. And we need to use the same three lines inside the uh, main uh, XML file within the uh, energy loss portion. And you can go to the main, main XML file. And so this is where the energy loss uh, starts. Uh, energy loss uh, portion of the main XML file starts. And at the end, I put this custom module uh, portion. And this is, uh, I posted in the Slack and you can use this, uh, you can copy that. Uh, I pinned it uh, for convenience and you can uh, use this. Uh, copy paste it to both the uh, user and main XML. How, how did you find this main XML file? So, okay. So the all the XML files av available are inside the config. So that is uh, ls uh, xk config. So there you, you have this uh, main XML file, Jetscape main, yeah. And then which line we have to add that custom model? So if you go to Jetscape main, uh, so first you have to find the starting point of the energy loss. Then if you go to the end, it's better to add uh, to the end, but you can add anywhere. Uh, so I just add it to the end after the idea safety. Okay. okay. So now you can run it with the use XML file on Jetscape, and the use XML file is in here. July eighteen 
framework and Jetscape user. And it will run very quickly because we only have one event. So we cannot put that user file in the config file uh, inside the escape directory. Uh, you can put that. There's a there's a XML file in the same name inside the config, but you can change the name and put it inside. Okay. So here you can see it uh, determines the task, uh, the custom module from here. And if we go a little further down, then you can see the initialization lines that we use. Uh, this is the first line that we uh, printed inside the init uh, function. And this is the second line. And when it executes, every time uh, this energy loss uh, uh, part on pass through this energy loss module, it prints this line. That's why even though we have one event, we have many uh, lines of uh, execution. And Finally, it finished uh, in no time. After adding this uh, custom module, you need to make, right? Sorry, I, I didn't hear it. And after uh, adding this custom module, we need to Remake again, right? Uh, yeah, you need to see make and make again. You don't need to see make, but you need to make again. I think this has been a great session so far. Chaturanga, thank you so much for leading the session and doing a great job. I would just uh, mention that while people have questions, please feel free to use the Slack channel for, that, for posting the questions. And we will continue answering the questions there. And I think we are due for a break, a quick short break for five minutes at this point. And we can reconvene for the next talk in five minutes, shop. Oh. Thank you very much, Aturanga. Yeah. Applause for you from my side. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's get started with our next presenter, Daniel Brandenburg from the Ohio State University. And just to recap, Chaturanga presented the usage of the Xscape and Jetscape framework in the previous hands-on session. So if you continue to have questions or you run into challenges in running the instructions, please send your questions on the Slack message and there's a team looking at your messages and we're in the process of replying. So in the meantime, while you're working on your Slack messages and let's say if some people are still working on, um, on running the Jetscape code, um, we will, uh, I think we'll, we'll, like I said, we'll continue uh, dealing with the uh, 
messages on the chat. And I think we can now start with the next talk on ultra peripheral collisions from Daniel Brandenburg. Over to you, Daniel. Thank you, Ritu. Uh, and thanks for the invitation. So it's a pleasure to, to speak for you today. Um, I, uh, I hope that you'll find something interesting in here. My goal with this talk is not to dive into any particular uh, topic into too much detail, but to try to give you an idea of the breadth and richness of the ultra peripheral collision program that's taking place at RIC, at LHC, and uh, at uh, future, future situations like the EIC as well. We'll have similar physics. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, here's a quick outline of the major topics that I hope to cover. So because this is a summer school, I wanted to start really at the beginning and talk about uh, what UPCs are, or these ultra peripheral collisions, what's interesting about them, and what types of processes can we study in UPCs. Uh, so once we cover that, and we have kind of a, a foundation, we'll talk about the basic formalism. And I really emphasize basic here. And one of the things I'll try to emphasize as we go through is really the amount of progress that there has been on both the experimental side and the theoretical side, uh, which has led to quite a bit of the exciting progress that's been made over the last 10 years in this field. Um, and so, okay, the introduction gives you the basics. The formalism gives you a feel for how these processes are calculated, what goes into some of the processes, um, and then we'll look at some of the available generators and then with that, I'll move in for the remainder of the talk to look at a sampling of the physics that can be studied through ultra peripheral collisions. Um, and I just wanna, I guess, give the caveat that this is a somewhat maybe biased selection. I've tried to choose some of the recent progress and some of the things that I personally find very exciting, um, mostly to communicate to you the richness of this uh, of this subfield, and also to emphasize uh, the diversity of topics in this subfield. And then I'll just end with a very quick summary uh, and and think a little bit about the connection to future programs, and and then we'll go from there. Um, I think the way this is set up, we can have questions at any time. I'm certainly okay with that. So uh, so please let me know and I guess someone will be monitoring uh, the Slack. Okay, so let's go ahead and start with the introduction. So what are these ultra peripheral collisions and what can we do with them? Uh, so the name ultra peripheral collision uh, comes from the fact that if we look at our standard heavy ion collisions where you have nuclear overlap, we use this nomenclature where a central collision, right, is this nice head on, almost complete overlap. And then as you increase the impact parameter, you come to semi-central and then semi-peripheral. And then peripheral is when you're just barely glancing in this collision. Um, and so this term ultra-peripheral is basically to take this nomenclature and just extend it to even larger impact parameters. And at some point, you get to a place where the impact parameter is so large that in fact, you don't have any nuclear overlap. Because the strong force is a short range force, you get to a place where you're fully separated with no hadronic interaction. And you may think, okay, nothing happens in that case. Uh, but the, the, the difference is that the electromagnetic force is long range. As you can see from this picture, the idea is that the electromagnetic field lines extend over a much longer distance than the, than the field of the strong force. And because of this, you can have interactions that are primarily electromagnetic, even at these much larger impact parameters. So that's what an ultra peripheral collision is. And the reason that they're interesting is because they, these, these heavy ions, which have a charge, um, which is sufficiently large, that you produce extremely large electromagnetic fields. So what I mean by that is it's the combination 
of a large amount of charge traveling very close to the speed of light. And it's in that scenario where you get these highly compressed Lorentz contracted field lines. So in this case, the black is the electric field lines and the blue are the circular magnetic field lines. You get these highly Lorentz contracted. And so what that means is that the density of the fields in some small unit volume is extremely, extremely high. And in fact, heavy ion collisions produce the strongest electromagnetic fields in the known universe. So even when you compare to things like neutron stars or, or pulsars that have these extremely strong fields, heavy ion collisions are even stronger, in some cases by a few orders of magnitude. Now, the trade-off is that these fields are very short-lived. They only really exist as they uh, overlap one another for a very short period of time. And the idea here is that we can think about these semi-classical fields. And because they're so short-lived, we have to treat them in the formalism of, of quantum mechanics. And really that's done through this thing called the equivalent photon approximation. You'll sometimes hear it referred to as the Weissacher-Williams approach. Um, or sometimes as Fermi's equivalent photon approximation. So these are all names of people who were really at the birth of quantum mechanics. And they, they were some of the first ones to tackle this problem of how do we view something like an electromagnetic field, which has a classical description, how do we view it on time scales and at speeds that require a quantum description? And that's this bridge uh, that we'll talk about more, which is the equivalent photon approximation. The basic idea, though, is that you have this highly Lorentz contracted electromagnetic field. And as you sample that or quantize that into photon quanta, the photon energy are given by the Fourier modes of the field's spatial distribution. So again, this is the quintessential connection between the semi-classical de description. So you can think of them as fields. And then the quantum description, where you think of these as individual photons. So in this description, the kind of interesting uh, characteristics are the energy of the photons that you can achieve. So this is given roughly by gamma uh, h bar c over the radius of the nucleus. So this corresponds to something on the order of tens of GeV at the Large Hadron Collider and a few GeV uh, at RIC. And I think the, the point here is that, again, we have uh, uniqueness in heavy ion collisions because we have such high energy photons. And remember that the energy in this case and the wavelength are related. So these are, another way to put it, very, very, very short wavelength photons. And we'll, we'll come back to why that's important when we talk about our ability to use these photons to perform imaging. Another characteristic is the very small transverse momentum. So if you look at these fields, they're almost completely Lorentz contracted into the transverse plane, which means that the photons themselves are traveling in the longitudinal plane or the Z axis. So 99.9% .9 of their momentum is in the Z direction and they have almost no spread in the transverse direction. We'll talk more about why this is important. And specifically, it gives a very unique um, signature to events that are produced by these photons. And then finally, in addition to the extremely high photon energy, we have something else which is quite important when we talk about quantum processes, which is that we have not only high energy photons, but we have very high rates of the photons or a, or a very high flux of photons. So what this means is we not only have high energy photons, but because the charge of the nuclei gold or lead are sufficiently large, you, you're in this case where you have Z times alpha. So alpha is about one over 137. So you have Z times alpha, which is close enough to one that you can really think of the photons as being very densely packed in phase space, which makes them likely to interact so that you can achieve these very interesting quantum processes that we'll talk about next. And so just to think about the rough scaling here, the photons from a single target scale like Z squared, where Z is the charge of the nucleus. So therefore, if you're talking about processes that involve two photons, 
you get an enhancement of the flux of Z to the fourth. So this is why heavy ion collisions are really perfect for this, because even if you think about the high energy uh, beams that were used in the last many decades, electron beams or proton beams just have a Z of one. So you don't get this enhancement effect. So it's really in the age of heavy ion collisions, starting with Rick and then now at the LHC, where we get to take advantage of these huge enhancements in the photon flux. So with that, let's talk about the two main classes of processes that we can achieve in ultra peripheral collisions. So I wanna give you here both the simplicity, but also the diversity of the processes that we can explore. So on the one hand, the simplicity is that we really look at two different types of processes. So as I mentioned a few slides ago, because the impact parameter is large, in order to have an interaction, there must be some electromagnetic exchange because it's the electromagnetic force which can actually traverse that distance when the impact parameter is large enough that there's no strong interaction. So the first class of events that can take, take uh, advantage of this are what we call two photon events or photon-photon interactions. And so this is a case where you get a photon from the field of each of these two nuclei and they can interact in, in several different ways, but I wanna highlight two of them here. So one of them is that the photons can interact with enough energy to produce a lepton-anti-lepton -lepton pair. So the lightest leptons, of course, are electrons. So the simplest process here is photon-photon fusion to an electron-positron pair. This is an extremely fundamental process in quantum electrodynamics. And in that sense, you might think it's uh, a bit boring to study, but it turns out that this type of process where you have photon-photon scattering is really the kind of the edge where you start to transition from plain old QED, which is governed by the superposition principle, which means that in the classical case, photons uh, don't interact, right? There's no photon scattering. In the quantum case where you get to strong fields, you start to have photon-photon fusion and interesting processes where you can produce uh, matter and antimatter. Even a higher order process is when these photons can scatter and through a box of either leptons or other charged particles, the, the photons that come in can go back out. This is known as light by light scattering. And again, this is a purely quantum process that requires this very unique situation that we mentioned before of high energy photons and very high density of photons. So this is the first class of processes where you have a photon from each nucleus. And in the later part of the talk, we'll look at how we can use these processes to explore fundamental aspects of QED, image the nucleus in terms of its charge distribution and electromagnetic fields, search for axions, and even test for physics beyond the standard model. The second main class of uh, processes that we can look at are a case where you get a photon from one of the nuclei, the field from one nucleus, and that photon travels to the other nucleus. And because of the hadronic structure of the photon, this photon can fluctuate momentarily into a quark anti quark pair, which then is able to interact with the other nucleus via the strong force. So you can think of this as a very high energy very small wavelength photon being used to image the other nucleus. So this is a very powerful technique and there are many different um, processes that have this basic structure. And the point is, is that we gain, in some cases, very direct information about the strong interaction taking place in the target nucleus. So we can achieve essentially any process which transforms this initial photon um, into anything else that has the same quantum numbers. So you can kind of think of vector mesons as heavy photons. So in terms of exclusive processes, you can have this photon scatter off of the target nucleus, produce a rho zero, a phi, a j psi, et cetera, and then decay to some daughter particles. In this case, a rho would decay to pi plus pi minus. So it's a very clean event. 
and it allows us to really study very interesting things about the nucleus. And we'll talk about exactly what we can study in the next sections. Now there's a bit of nomenclature here and a bit of, uh, like I said, on the one hand, we have just these two main categories of processes, but actually there's quite a bit of richness as to how these processes can take place and the subtleties that are involved. So for one, we can distinguish between what we call coherent interactions, where these pomeron or gluons, this two gluon state is emitted by the entire target nucleus and the target nucleus stays intact. So this is what we call a coherent interaction. And again, the idea is that in terms of the quantum state, it remains coherent before and after the interaction. And coherent interactions are characterized by these very small momentum transfers. And as we'll talk about in the next slide, what we call a diffractive interaction. You can also have an incoherent interaction where the nucleus um, is actually broken apart. And in this case, it generally means that the gluons are interacting with a single nucleon inside the nucleus. That's what causes the nucleus to break up is because you're really scattering off of an individual nucleon. This leads to much larger trans, uh, momentum transfers and a much different uh, view of the physics inside the nucleus. So these are different types of interactions that we can look at, and we'll talk about the different physics that we can access through these as we go forward. Now, one more thing I want to mention about the nomenclature is that if you look at a diagram that we show up here, we generally, generally talk about these as exclusive processes, because as you can see from this diagram, there's nothing else happening. We have a photon emitted by one, we have uh, a, a multi-gluon state emitted by the target, and then we produce a single well-defined final state. Sometimes we use this term a little bit loosely in UPC, and I'll explain that um, in the next couple slides. Um, but in recent years, people have also become more interested in inclusive final states. So things like the production of jets in UPCs um, or just a large number of particles to look for things like flow, um, or baryon stopping. And so traditionally we've looked at a lot of exclusive processes, but people are becoming more and more interested in these inclusive measurements as well. So with that, let me uh, mention one more term, which is this idea of diffraction. So you'll often hear of these processes called diffractive photonuclear processes, for instance. And as I just mentioned, this idea of diffraction and coherence uh, go hand in hand. And so phenomenologically, the, def the definition that you'll hear often for diffraction is this idea that you have scattering with a rapidity gap. And this is really an analog to the standard idea of diffraction that you have in optics, where you have a coherent source which travels through a slit or hits a target, either one will work. So you travel through a slit and this diffraction pattern uh, describes how the light scatters as a wave-like particle through that slit. We observe the same type of thing in photonuclear interactions, where if you look at the, in this case, in momentum space, the momentum transfer uh, that leads to the production of these heavy photons, these vector meson states, what you'll see is a, is a very clear diffractive pattern. And I showed that on the previous slide in terms of these coherent interactions. So the point is, is that if you hear diffraction or coherence, um, this is the basic idea behind these. And as we'll discuss as we go forward, there's actually some difficulty in very precisely defining the theoretical definition for these events. In some cases, what we thought counted for diffraction um, is being shown to be challenged by some very recent measurements. So there's definitely some interesting things to be discovered here. Daniel? Yes. There's a question. Um, what is the maximum center of mass energy in the UPC photon interactions? Right. So it depends on the process. But as I mentioned earlier, the characteristic photon energies are something like this. So if you have, um, you know, if you have two photon interactions, it'll be related to this. 
If you have a photon nucleus interaction, it's generally less than this because, um, because of the Pomeron distribution. But uh, I think at LHC, for instance, we have center of mass collisions you know, in the tens of GeV. So it's related to these parameters here. Another question, could you please explain again coherent and non-coherent processes? Right. So coherence, so coherence in general means that the quantum state remains intact before and after the interaction. In this case, we use it in that meaning, but we use it to mean that the nucleus stays intact before and after the interaction. So in this case, this upper diagram where you see the, the nucleus as a whole comes in, interacts through this two gluon state, and then exits still as a lead nucleus without breaking apart. So this is a coherent interaction. In contrast, an incoherent interaction is where the gluons um, that interact with this dipole are really emitted from a single proton or a single nucleon inside this nucleus. And because of that, the nucleus will break apart after this interaction. So coherence means you're interacting with the whole nucleus and it stays intact. Incoherent means you're interacting with some part of the nucleus and that generally leads it to, to break apart. So who will interact with the nucleus? The photon or? That's right. So the photon, so the photon has a very rich hadronic structure. So the photon can fluctuate into anything that has the same quantum numbers, right? So the mm -hmm. photon can fluctuate, for instance, into a quark any quark pair. And that's what that's what's illustrated by this diagram here. So you have a quark any quark pair. And that quark any quark pair are objects that can feel the strong force. So they're what interact directly with the target nucleus. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, the, the last topic I wanted to just point out with this uh, diffraction is that experimentally, the way that, that, that we can select for diffractive events are to look for activity roughly in the central rapidity region. And then we, we tend to veto activity in the forward and backwards uh, regions and look for just remnants of the beam to look for this, uh, this evidence that the beam stayed intact. So I'll explain this in a little more detail, but that's from an experimental standpoint, what it actually looks like to try to select these diffractive events. So you want a mostly empty detector with just a little bit of activity and no activity in the forward and backward regions. So with that, let's move ahead to the basic formalism. And with this basic formalism, I'm gonna focus on the formalism of the photons, since that's the common piece between the photon-photon processes and the photonuclear processes. And I'll basically leave the theoretical treatment of the photonuclear process to the real theorists because it's a much more complicated and difficult uh, task in QCD. For the QED side of things, it's a bit more uh, within my pay grade to discuss. So if we start with that, we can think about in quantum mechanics, the, the concept of pair production from electromagnetic fields. So just a quick history lesson. It was in 1951, already a decade or two after the development of quantum mechanics, that Julian Schwinger developed what we consider now the quintessential form of electron-positron pair production in QED. And the idea here is that once the vacuum becomes saturated with a critical field strength, at some point it actually begins to break down and it's more favorable for the vacuum to produce these electron-positron fields uh, pairs than to continue to increase the field strength. And that field strength, that critical field strength is related to the mass of the electron and other fundamental constants. And it's something on the order of uh, 1.3 times 10 to the 16 volts per centimeter. Now, this is an extremely strong field strength by everyday standards, but it turns out that in heavy ion collisions, where we have these large amounts of charge and very fast interactions, that we actually do achieve field strengths, not only this strong, but actually a few orders of magnitude stronger in the case of, of LHC collisions, for instance. So in principle, we're getting to this place where the vacuum 
is unstable against pair production. The difference though is that in heavy ion collisions, these nuclei pass each other very, very quickly. And so you really can't think of these as static electromagnetic fields. And so they don't have well-defined characteristics in terms of uh, the Schwinger mechanism. Instead, we have to think of this as a quantum process where we have individual photon quanta interacting in a scattering experiment. And so that's the basics of the formalism is we want to take these heavy ion collisions, we wanna take the fields of these heavy ion collisions and we wanna express them as these pho photon quanta. And so that means we wanna know a couple of things. We wanna understand what are the basic distributions and kinematics of the photons. And we wanna be able to calculate cross sections. So how often do the photons interact? And when they interact, what processes do they produce? So the basic formalism here is what we call the external field approximation. And this basically just means that as these nuclei pass one another, they go undeflected. And so the field can be thought of as external uh, to the nuclei. And again, we come back to this idea of coherence. The reason you get these z squared or z to the fourth enhancements is because the field that we're talking about is the field that comes from the entire nucleus. So the sum distribution of all the different charge within a given nucleus. So uh, mathematically, we start from the electromagnetic four potential. And this looks a little bit scary, but it's, it's really just a couple of pieces put together. So for instance, this, um, so, I'll, go, I'll just go through each term. So you have the charge of the, of the nucleus, which is Z. You have the factor of E, which is the electric charge. Um, this exponential factor is just this, it's, it's related to the spatial distribution of the field where this B perp is the, dis, the, the spatial extent of the field. This delta function just says, it just encodes this idea that the nuclei are not deflected. So the delta function says that the momentum has to stay in a straight line. And then finally, this F is the form factor of the nucleus. So the F just tells you how is the charge distributed within the nucleus. And if we take those pieces, we can then convert that into these quantized photons according to the equivalent photon approximation. And the quintessential thing here is that the photon number density in in this case, is proportional to the time averaged energy flux. So what that means is, is that the, the pointing vector or the time averaged energy flux of the field is directly proportional to the number of photons that are carrying that field. And so if you take the information on the previous slide and you put it in here, you can make an expression for the number of photons at a given energy and at a given distance away from the center of the nucleus as a function of these electromagnetic fields that we just expressed in terms of the four potentials. So, you know, again, this, this may look a little complicated, but it's really a couple of basic uh, pieces. This is where you have the, the charge squared, so that Z squared enhancement. And again, it's because the photon density is proportional to this uh, pointing vector, which is the electric field squared. And then you want to you have to do a bit of math to get out the spatial distribution and the energy distribution. So omega and the B perp. And we'll talk a little bit more about that because our understanding of this has, has evolved over the years. But this is the basic formalism. Once you have this, you now have an idea of how many photons of what energy you have in your interaction. And I just point out that this time averaged energy flux, as I mentioned, it's inherently connected to the strength of the field but also this extremely short lifetime of the overlap of the two fields. Okay, so there's one more piece of the formalism that has been uh, really discovered in recent, year, recent years. And I wanna connect this to more standard heavy ion collisions. So as we know in standard heavy ion collisions, one of the most fundamental characteristics of an event is the centrality class that that event comes from. And I showed you this diagram earlier where we have now been using for, for a couple of decades, this Glauber model 
to connect the in initial condition of the event, so the initial geometry or impact parameter, to the final uh, multiplicity distribution so that we can determine the centrality of the event. So in normal heavy ion collisions, this geometry effect is the key connection. And that's the key insight that Glauber gave us through the, the optical um, scattering theory. And this has been hugely successful in allowing us to characterize events at different impact parameters. In ultra peripheral collisions, the situation is a bit harder. We have an almost empty detector because these nuclei pass one another with large impact parameter. And as we mentioned, most of these processes are exclusive, which means that they produce maybe just two tracks in the entire event. And that doesn't give us a lot of information. It certainly doesn't give us a multiplicity distribution that we can use Glauber on the way that you have in normal um, heavy ion collisions. So actually already for a couple of decades, there was really no concept for how we could access the impact parameter in these ultra peripheral collisions. And this actually, I really can't do justice to the subtlety of this, of this topic. Because in some sense, there was already this idea that you can't directly access the impact parameter because the impact parameter through the uncertainty principle should be conjugate to some of the momentum transfer that you have in these interactions. And so there's been quite a bit of debate over the years of exactly what information can you access directly? Um, are you limited by the uncertainty principle? And is there even any validity to the idea of an impact parameter dependent ultra peripheral collision? And so there's been a lot of discussion and debate and progress made. Um, a lot of that has come through very surprising experimental measurements. I'll just highlight a few of those. And then there has to be some wrestling between exper experiment and theory to really make sense of what we're seeing. Daniel, there are a couple yes. of questions in the, in the, in the um, oh, okay. lecture. Good. So, Go ahead. how do we separate coherent and non coherent processes in experiments by looking at the number of vector mesons? No. So, in, in each case, so coherent and incoherent, you're still only going to produce one exclusive final state. So, you produce a single vector meson, for instance. And the answer is that you can roughly separate them based on the momentum transfer. So, this ends up being like the, the PT or the PT squared of the, of the vector meson. So T is approximately the PT squared of the vector meson. So you can, only roughly, you can only roughly separate them by saying that pairs that are produced with a very low transverse momentum are coherent, and pairs produced with a larger transverse momentum are incoherent. That works quite well, as long as you're in those separate regions. But for instance, it's very hard to separate them in this region where there's significant overlap. And this is actually something we're still working on, is how do you separate these? This is a topic that's very important for EIC physics because we want to study saturation, for instance. And for that, you'd like to access the coherent production way out here at higher T. And that's very difficult if you have no technique for separating these. So that's the short answer. The, the, the longer answer is that it's difficult and there's actually quite a lot of um, subtleties as to how people are trying to do this. Mm -hmm. So when so, you define the higher uh, momentum, so is there any cutoff or? or yeah. um, so no, I mean, in principle, there's no cutoff. Both of these go on kind of, uh, kind of indefinitely. I guess there's, a, there's an implicit cutoff just at the photon energy level. No, no, no. I'm asking it uh, from which PT we can take that this is coherent and from. Ah, uh, so this this corresponds to about 100 MeV for heavy ion targets. So above 100 MeV, you're pretty well dominated by incoherent. Below 100 MeV, you're pretty well dominated by coherent interactions. Okay. Okay. The second question is: Would the external energy approximation still hold good for PP? Ah, very good question. So in PP and in EE scattering, you have to be a lot more careful about this. And in general, so in general, it doesn't hold because they can uh, easily become deflected. However, in both PP and 
E plus E minus scatterings. Over the years, there have been cases where people look for, um, so like in proton-proton collisions at the LHC, for instance, and at RIC, we have like Roman pops, for instance, which can look for the protons that are that are just barely scattered or not scattered at all. And so you're looking for this case where there's essentially no deflection. In those types of events, the, the external field approximation still applies. But, but for instance, an electron-positron scattering, most of the scatterings are cases where the electron-positron really do get deflected, and those are not uh, valid with this description. So this is really focused on heavy ion collisions where there's no, you know, no deflection, and it only applies to a very small, very special selection in E plus E minus or proton-proton collisions. Good. Are there other questions? Yes, one more. Okay. Can you please explain again what the second point in the external external field approximation means? Uh, the, the second bullet here? Yes, that one. Yeah. Yeah. So this just means that you're we're dominated by photons that are emitted coherently by the full electromagnetic field of the nucleus. So what that means is, is that uh, you know, a nucleus is this collection of protons and neutrons. The field of an individual proton is characterized by Z, like I said, whereas the full nucleus has, sorry, sorry an individual proton has just a Z of one, whereas the full nucleus has Z protons in it. And so this idea is that we're looking at the electromagnetic field of the full nucleus, which is characterized by this Z squared term. So we get this really large enhancement because we're looking at the whole field, not just the field of an individual proton. Okay. So let me make this last point and then we'll start to dig into a couple of physics, uh, physics uh, results. And if there's more questions, please let me know. So, I mentioned earlier that this, this uh, term exclusive is sometimes used a bit casually in ultra peripheral collisions. And the reason for that is also related back to what we just talked about is this problem of impact parameter. So um, from an experimental standpoint, an, a truly exclusive process can be quite difficult to trigger on. Because as I mentioned, you have an, almost a completely empty detector and you might produce just a single electron positron pair or a single pair of photons, or some very limited final state like that. It can make it very hard to trigger on because of those very low multiplicity, mostly empty detectors. However, we can have a situation where the nuclei interact according to, the, to this physics process that we're interested in. So for instance, a two photon interaction, and then also exchange virtual photons. So these are photons that are very strong interactions and or characterized by, by a larger momentum transfer. And this will often excite the nuclei and cause them to dissociate after the interaction. So this is why we, we refer to these processes as quasi-exclusive or just casually as exclusive because the physics process is exclusive. But in reality, you can have these other virtual photon exchanges that um, modify the state of the nucleus and cause them to, to decay. However, it's very useful from an experimental technique because this gives us a very clean uh, signature for these types of ultra peripheral events. And so if we look at, for instance, the star zero degree calorimeters, these types of events give you a very clean single neutron two neutron, three neutron, four neutron distribution. Whereas in a heavy ion collision, you won't get these well separated neutron peaks. So this is indicative of an ultra peripheral collision and gives us a very clean technique for triggering on these types of events. It turns out that this is also super beneficial for testing the impact parameter. So we can characterize events by the number of neutrons that we see in these ZDCs. So we use the shorthand which with like X and X in, which means the number on one side 
of the ZDC and the number on the other side of the ZDC. And the idea here is that these nuclei get excited by these virtual photons and the cross section. So basically the nuclei get excited to some excited state. And then in order to decay back to the ground state, they have to emit one or more neutrons, or in some case they emit photons, but we don't detect those generally. And the cross section for this has been well measured over the years. And there's actually regions where it's so large that it's referred to as this giant dipole resonance. So you excite the nucleus into this resonance, it decays by emitting neutrons, and that's what we measure in our zero degree calorimeters. It's a little bit different from one experiment to the next. Um, Atlas probably has the greatest flexibility where they're actually able to see events where you have no neutrons on one side and then some number of neutrons on the other side. So that's like the zero in XN or XN zero in. And then you have the cases where there's several neutrons on either side. And you can see over here more clearly, you have the one neutron peak, two neutron, three neutron, four neutron, et cetera. The reason that this is so important is because it was discovered in the last several years that you can actually use this to determine the impact parameter of your ultra peripheral collision. So roughly speaking, um, when you have only a few number of neutrons emitted, that's looking at large impact parameters. Whereas when you have a very large number of neutrons emitted, you're looking at small impact parameters. And the reason for this is that when the nuclei pass one another, they'll exchange more and harder virtual photons if they're very close together. And that tends to break the nucleus up more and cause more neutrons to be emitted. Whereas if you're very far apart, you tend to only emit maybe one neutron and that corresponds to these much smaller impact parameters. So this actually was confirmed by the star uh, Atlas, Elise, and CMS experiments just in the last few years. So what you can see over here is just um, a measurement, and we'll talk about what these measurements are coming forward, but it's a measurement of the two-photon process as a function of these different neutron classes. And the kind of old-school models showed no dependence because they didn't expect any impact parameter dependence to these uh, physics processes. But you can see that if you calculate this with these impact parameter dependent effects, you get qualitatively exactly what you see in the data, which is this rising trend in this alpha variable. The point here is just to show that this was one of the first experimental measurements that showed really clearly this impact parameter dependence in ultra peripheral collisions. And the point here is that we're developing the formalism kind of like Glauber in normal heavy ion collisions that really gives us this differential um, ability to look at these UPC events. Like I said, this has been confirmed by pretty much all the major experiments at this point, and we'll look at uh, a few examples of that. So with that, I'll go ahead and end talking about kind of the formalism and the theory uh, that goes into the UPC events and how the photons are, are characterized. There's quite a few different models that have been used over the years. Starlight is probably the most common. It's been used for 20 plus years, and there's countless uh, comparisons between experiment and the starlight model. It has quite a few different assumptions and simplifications in it um, that make it not the best for certain types of, of comparisons. And because of that, there's been a handful of additional models over the years that kind of go above and beyond starlight in very specific ways. So I'll leave this for you to look at uh, later. It's more of a reference. In the last few years, really with the ability to do Monte Carlo integration, we've been able to do very rigorous theoretical descriptions of these processes, where instead of using models, we can really address things directly from QED. We can uh, describe these processes using Wigner functions, which for those of you familiar with other parts of our field, there's really growing interest in being able to describe the gluons and the partons within the nucleus in terms of these Wigner functions. And so there's a lot of overlap between these kind of pure QED things and uh, the approaches that are being taken in, in more uh, nuclear physics aspects. 
So the point here is that we've really, in the last few years, reached a, ri a rigorous theoretical description. And it's through these approaches that we've become aware of things like the impact parameter dependence and some other subtleties that were not understood in previous years. So with that, I want to spend the rest of the time talking about some physics results. And um, if there's questions, then please go ahead and continue to ask questions. So let's start with a couple of the two photon uh, highlights. So probably the most uh, famous of the ultra peripheral collision measurements is light by light scattering. This is a purely quantum mechanical process where, as I mentioned earlier, you have two photons interact through some kind of charged particle in, a, in this box and then go back out uh, to photons. So experimentally, this can be challenging to measure because you have background from lepton production and from central exclusive production where you essentially have gluons produce these photons instead of photons in the initial state. Now, light by light scattering is interesting because it basically signals the transition into this strong field regime of QED where you essentially have photon self interaction. And that makes QED a bit more like Q QCD where gluons are allowed to self interact. And because of that, you get a lot of rich phenomena once you get beyond this strong field regime. So Atlas observed this first. Uh, and yeah, before we move on, there are some questions. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So in inclusive jets, can I expect such clearer neutron peaks as in, as, as in inc exclusive jets? So, yeah, so again, the idea here is that these processes are separable or factorizable. So whatever physics process you look at here should leave the nucleus essentially intact. For a coherent process, that's true. And even for an incoherent process, um, the physics process here is still leaving the nucleus essentially intact. So it's not completely breaking up the nucleus. And so you'll still see well-defined neutron peaks in those types of events. It becomes more challenging as you start to look for inclusive events with a large number of particles produced. So for instance, for the study of flow, people are becoming interested in photonuclear events where you really break the nucleus up into lots and lots of particles. In this case, it may be a bit more difficult to observe these, but you still want the same basic characteristics. So you still want a rapidity gap and at least one neutron in the, in the target going direction. So there are some subtleties, but I would say the main characteristics are the same. Second question, can you access central mass energy in the photon-photon system experimentally? Um, so I'll actually get to a result about this. There's an ambiguity, um, but ATLAS actually has done some measurements where they look at the photon uh, energy distribution. And I don't think I have a plot here. So you have to resolve the ambiguity from the fact that you don't know which photon is coming from which field. But because you produce a final state, and you measure all the kinematics. So right, the so for instance, if you produce an E plus E minus, you know the momentum and the invariant mass of the intermediate state. Because of that, you can make measurements sensitive to the photon-photon uh, center of mass energy. Okay, last question. Is super chic, chic, chic? I, I don't know how this, <laughs> chic, chic, <laughs> for example, comparable in some ways with Xscape? Can we use functions of X K with the Monte Carlo from Super Chick? I that's a very interesting question. I I don't think I am I know Super Chick well enough. Uh, the, this is very actively maintained by Harlan. So if you're interested, I would send him an email. He's very quick to respond and um, generally quite happy to collaborate on things. So I would suggest that, but I don't know the answer myself. Okay, that's it. Good. So let me try to speed up a little bit so that I can get through um, some of the physics. But so as I mentioned, light by light scattering was was first found by Atlas with some just evidence, so less than five sigma, published in uh, Nature Physics, and then the observation was published in PRL just a few years ago. Since that time, there have been observations by the other experiments, and the combined results between Atlas and CMS 
are shown over here on the right compared to the standard model prediction, in this case from SuperSheq and then from another theory group. And the interesting thing here is that it's not very significant at this point, but there is a small discrepancy. And this is especially interesting because this light by light process can be used to search for physics beyond the standard model. So specifically, the photons will couple to an axion-like particle, which can then decay back into photons. And so if you see an anomalous increase in the cross-section for this light by light scattering process, you can potentially attribute that to an axion-like particle. And because we have kinematic information from the diphoton system, you can really explore that in terms of the coupling and the mass of this axion-like particle. So again, currently the excess is quite small um, in, in terms of its statistical significance, uh, but there is a small evidence of this, and it's a, it's a direction that the LHC programs are very interested in pursuing as we get orders of magnitude more data. With that, let's move on and talk a little bit about the lepton-antilepton -lepton production. So as I mentioned earlier, this idea of photon-photon fusion to uh, a matter-antimatter pair, it's a really fundamental idea that came at the very beginning of quantum mechanics. And again, it's a, it's a nonlinear effect that's forbidden in classical electromagnetism, but allowed in the quantum theory. And the real important new thing that we learned from this process over the last few years is that if we look at these ultra peripheral collisions in the transverse plane, we actually see that the electric fields are radially outward and the magnetic fields are circling around the nuclei. Well, it turns out this is the distribution you expect for linearly polarized photons. And so if you think about it, you can have interactions really anywhere in space. And depending on where in space they are, the photon's polarization will be different depending on how they're aligned with the electric field lines. Well, it turns out that this exact scenario is perfect for testing one of these very early predictions from quantum mechanics that hadn't been observed for more than 80 years. And that's this idea that there's a change in the cross-section for photon-photon interactions depending on the polarization. And we can also use this to really understand the process, because if we think about the two photons interacting, real photons can only have certain spin combinations. So specifically, real photons have the helicity zero state forbidden. And because of that, you can only have these blue parts of the, the spin density matrix filled. And that has a really a direct impact on the, um, on the cross section that you observe, especially the differential cross section. And specifically, what was discovered just a few years ago is that this should lead to a flow-like effect or, a, or an azimuthal modulation in the production of this electron-positron pair with respect to the pair's momentum. And this was observed by Starr just a few years ago, where you can see this very clear modulation, both in ultra peripheral collisions and actually in the same process in these very peripheral collisions. And so in this case, um, there's quite a bit more I could say about this, but from a, a UPC standpoint, it was the very first proof that these photons are linearly polarized. And we'll come back to why that's important if we have time. So just quickly, I'll say that you can use this uh, this uh, photon photon fusion idea also to search for physics beyond the standard model, and you can look up uh, that if you're interested in more details. I'll go ahead and move on. So Atlas has done quite a few measurements. One of the new ones that they've pioneered is the look at uh, di tau production. So taus are the heaviest of the leptons, and they're especially interesting um, because you can use them to search for physics beyond the standard model. So the first measurements of this from CMS and ATLAS just came out recently. And the important thing is that you can actually use these decays to access the anomalous magnetic moment of the tau lepton. And the measurements are starting to get more and more precise as the techniques are developed and as we gain more and more statistics. And the really exciting thing is that the results from the heavy ion collisions are already competitive 
with the previous best measurements uh, in the world before these techniques. And so the exciting thing is that as we gain more data in the future LHC runs, we're going to have significantly more precision and potential ability to access physics beyond the standard model through these types of measurements. Okay, we've had some questions. How am I doing on time? I think I have another 10 minutes. I think we have to end at 11, uh, as in in four minutes, oh, okay. 11 simple time. But I think uh, you may take a few more minutes to wrap up. Let me go through a few more. Okay, I thought it was an hour plus 20. Um, okay, so let me end with just a couple of highlights about this second set of processes called photonuclear interactions. So this idea of using photons to study the nucleus is already something that has been for decades um, recognized as a very powerful technique for studying nuclear matter. So it goes all the way back to the days of Hera and, and Zeus. And we don't have time to talk about the details, but I just wanna show you some plots like this where theoretical calculations can look at what the cross-section they expect for some of these different processes. And what I want you to, to take away from this is the, sh the sheer spread in the predictions. So these types of interactions are sensitive to gluon distributions. So they're, they're sensitive to things like saturation, shadowing, and nuclear structure. And a lot of this is really still unconstrained. So we still don't know the universal features of saturation. There's still a lot of questions about shadowing and how that plays out in heavy ion collisions. And so you get these kinds of differences in the models that are still largely unconstrained. And it just emphasizes that this is really still a very wide open field where we need lots of um, new measurements. So one of the things that's developed in the last couple of years is to use these incoherent measurements to actually look at the fluctuations within large nuclei. And this is really pioneered by a couple of theorists in our field that have recognized that, they're, that they have sensitivity here. And you, you can actually produce these really beautiful pictures where you can see that depending on how you model the nucleus, the size of these hot spots that fluctuate within the nucleus, you get a very different prediction for the incoherent cross-section of things like J-psi production. And specifically what happens is that as you turn on the fluctuation inside the nucleus, you increase the incoherent production. And so the data is starting to be precise enough that we can start to really set some limits on the amount of fluctuation that we have, uh, event by event fluctuations inside these collisions. So I'll skip this topic. And I wanna come back to this one because it's a very new result. So I spoke a little bit about the ambiguity earlier with one of the questions. When we have this photonuclear interaction, we can have a photon emitted from one nucleus that uh, interacts with the other nucleus, or we can have the second nucleus emit the photon and interact with the first nucleus. This causes an ambiguity as to which one was the photon emitter, and it was just recently realized that you can try to solve this by doing a couple of measurements simultaneously. And this has been recently done by CMS and Elise. And this is related to the question earlier, which is this allows you to really look at measurements in the photon nucleus center of mass frame. And that's important because it's in that center of mass frame where you can really pretty clearly distinguish a lot of these different effects due to the gluon distributions and the dynamics within the nucleus. So again, I wanna emphasize here, since we don't have time to go through the details, just the sheer spread in these theoretical predictions and the fact that we're just now for the first time having measurements that are sensitive to these shadowing effects, saturation effects, and other uh, really complicated gluon dynamics. So with that, I'll end um, with just one or two more measurements and then I'll summarize. Uh, one of the things that's really becoming possible with the added statistics is testing of nuclear PDFs with things like JSI production in lead lead. And again, I might sound a little bit like a broken record, but I want to point out that these new measurements are really starting to constrain theoretical predictions that based on previous data alone still had quite a large amount of spread. 
So these are again, quite a few different theoretical calculations with different assumption about the gluon dynamics, whether that's saturation effects or shadowing. And as you can see, the data is reaching a precision where we're really able to make strong constraints on which theoretical models are allowed and which are not allowed. And these really have direct impacts on the nuclear PDF distributions that then feed back into lots of other processes. Since this is for Jetscape, I wanted to talk at least about one diffractive dijet measurement. So in these diffractive events, you can look for back-to-back -back jets. And these are especially interesting, not only for testing nuclear PDFs through DIS measurements, but because you can look at this dijet and there are the theory calculations from saturation measurements that say that you should get azimuthal modulations in this dijet production that are directly sensitive to the elliptic gluon Wigner function. And this is where earlier I mentioned that the QED processes are starting to be described in terms of Wigner functions. And that theoretical progress has really helped us because there's a lot of analogy here in terms of the elliptic gluon Wigner functions. So these measurements are still not really possible at existing uh, uh, LHC and RIC experiments, but they're starting to become possible. And they're also something which is really targeted for the electron ion collider. Um, and so this is a very exciting future prospect. And I really look forward to these types of DIJET measurements. So with that, I'll go ahead and end. I had a few more topics that I suspected I wouldn't get through, but I encourage you to look at the slides if you're interested. And with that, I'll just go ahead and summarize. Yeah, so there is one more. There's one, there's one more question. Oh, okay, good. What is NQ? Uh, sorry, on which slide? Uh, that has already been answered uh, by Chun in the model, so in the in the Slack. So we can let Daniel finish up. Okay, thank you. So I'll just go ahead and summarize there. So the point is that ultra peripheral collisions are quite interesting. It's a very rich and growing subfield, and uh, I hope I impressed upon you the sheer number of topics that you can actually address with these. Uh, types of, of interactions, there's quite a natural connection both to the past of our field, but also the future in terms of EIC physics and future LHC programs. We really talked about two types of processes, the two photon physics, which allow us to test pure QED effects. And we're really reaching the kind of precision we need to begin to access physics beyond the standard model which is a really exciting application of this uh, physics, which is maybe starting out with pure QED, which you may think is not so novel and really going beyond that. And then we talked about these photonuclear interactions, which allow us to image the nucleus and to study nuclear uh, dynamics in different ways. And then finally, um, I just wanna point out that there's been so much progress from both the experimental side and the theoretical side that we're really, developing entire new approaches to lots of topics that have been important in the field for a long time. Now we can access them through these ultra peripheral collisions. And so there's a lot of exciting things to come in terms of future LHC programs and also as we develop the EIC physics. So with that, thank you. And I hope you enjoyed some part of that. Thank you, Daniel. We sure did enjoy everything that you presented and thank you for